welcome everybody. My name is Marco Verani from Politecnico of Milano. Uh, I will chair this afternoon session and uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce the first speaker. He's a Professor Ern from uh, AMPCA in RIA, Paris, France, and uh, he's going to talk about a very interesting and uh, <laughs> promising uh, talk. Uh, uh, he's going to talk about hybrid I order methods for wave propagation or unfitted meshes. So please, Alexander, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Marco, for the introduction and my very warm thanks to uh, Paola, Lorenzo, Stefano, the organizers, for putting the energy uh, to organize this workshop uh, despite the circumstances and for their invitation to present uh, uh, this, uh, this work, which is actually in collaboration with Eric Berman from London and two uh, of my former postdocs, uh, Guillaume Delay, who is now uh, assistant professor at Sorbonne University and Omar Duran, uh, who is now postdoc at Bergen University. And this is in collaboration with the French Agency for Atomic Energy, CEA. So I'd like to uh, discuss hybrid high order methods. First, I will briefly uh, uh, recall um, the basic features, and then I will move on to um, their uh, use uh, you, uh, with unfitted meshes um, and then I will move to the second main topic of the presentation, wave propagation. Uh, first on fitted meshes and then uh, the ultimate goal on unfitted meshes. So in a nutshell, so HHO methods were introduced uh, about seven years ago uh, by Daniele Di Pietro and myself. Uh, and the idea is to locate degrees of freedom, so discrete unknowns in the mesh cells and on the mesh faces. So you have a picture. Um, I guess everyone can see the arrow uh, when I move it. So there is like a very basic picture with uh, a mesh uh, composed of three uh, polygonal cells. And then for k equals zero, you will put one degree of freedom in each uh, edge uh, and one in each uh, cell. And then uh, for k equal one, you will have three in the cell and two in the edges. And there is no continuity from one edge to the other. And everything generalizes to 3D, of course. So the two basic ingredients are um, in each cell, a local gradient reconstruction operator from your local unknowns, and also local stabilization whose purpose is to enforce in a weak sense, in a least square sense, the matching of the trace of the cell unknowns with the face unknown. And uh, as in classical finite elements, the problem is assembled uh, cell-wise. So just a little bit of notation. So we consider a mesh cell T and then we have for simplicity, a polynomial of degree K and the same degree K on the faces. Uh, so this is the notation here. I'm trying to have like some kind of color code for the cell and face unknowns like this blue and this light blue. And then the violet would be the hybrid. So the pair composed of the two, which lives in this space with a hat. So hat systematically means these hybrid unknowns, which are pairs attached to the cell and to the faces of the cell. And so to reconstruct a gradient, one possibility is actually to reconstruct the potential uh, and then take the gradient of this color function. So you reconstruct the potential of degree K plus one. And the idea is a mimic an integration by parts formula uh, using your cell and your face unknowns. And then you have to invert uh, the local stiffness matrix in the cell. Then you take the gradient to have your uh, reconstruction. Concerning the stabilization, so we want to have some least squares um, a penalty on the difference between the trace of the cell unknown and the face unknown. So let's call it delta. And so one simple idea would be to put delta, but to get optimality in the convergence rate, there are actually some corrections that have to be introduced, um, including a correction depending on the reconstruction. So then when you have these two ingredients, then the uh, local bilinear form for the Poisson model problem is uh, very simple to form. You take your gradient reconstructions and form a Galerkin term, and then the stabilization, which is weighted by the reciprocal of the cell diameter. Uh, in all this presentation, I am isotropic, so I have only one length scale per, uh, per cell. 
So you can prove a stability and boundedness for this uh, bilinear form uh, using uh, a local H1-like seminorm, which is the gradient of the set unknown and the weighted trace, a difference of the trace and the face unknown, uh, which is a seminorm locally, but globally, if you have uh, homogeneous uh, uh, Irikle conditions, at least on part of the boundary, this becomes a norm. And then one point, I'm not going into the details here, but I'll just mention that the convergence analysis of um, HHO method uh, relies on what we call a reduction operator, which actually maps functions to pairs, so to hybrid uh, discrete objects. And it's a very simple uh, operator. It's only based on L2 orthogonal projections on the cell and independently on the faces. And combined with the reconstruction and the stabilization operators defined in the previous slide, uh, this leads to optimal uh, decay rates for smooth solutions. So as I mentioned, then uh, the assembly is uh, uh, cell-wise as in finite elements. So essentially you have all your cells here and then you patch everything together. You have of course, single valued unknowns on the faces. Here you have uh, hanging nodes. I mean, this is quite familiar to this audience. So this is like a pentagon here that is uh, uh, considered by the method. So globally, you will have um, uh, the global unknowns hat UH that are piecewise polynomials of degree K uh, on the cells and piecewise polynomials of degree K on the faces. And the global assembly will consist of summing the local bilinear forms on each cell. You can enforce directly conditions directly on the face boundary uh, DOFs. And an important point is that all the cell degrees of freedom, so all these blue dots can be eliminated locally so that at the end of the day, only the uh, phase dots are uh, globally coupled and solve what is called the global transmission problem. Uh, and then you recover by simple post-processing the cell dots. So the main characteristics is support of polytopal meshes with hanging nodes, optimal error estimates, Local conservation, which means that uh, you have uh, um, balanced fluxes on the faces that are in equilibrium with uh, uh, the source terms in every cell. An attractive computational cost because of the um, uh, static condensation and the compact stencil coupling uh, faces. The stencil is though a little bit less compact than in DG methods. Uh, uh, let me mention that. So uh, in this talk, I will actually consider some variants of the method. The first one is that instead of reconstructing the gradient as a gradient of, poly of scalar polynomials of degree K, we'll actually reconstruct the gradient as a vector valued polynomial of degree K, uh, again, by mimicking an integration by parts formula. Actually, this is cheaper than the other reconstruction because for this uh, uh, object, you only need to invert the scalar mass matrix uh, because all the uh, components of this vector uh, will have the same metrics. And this is useful for nonlinear problems, uh, as is mentioned in various uh, works before. Uh, although here I'm not dealing with nonlinear problems, but if you want to read more, you can check these references. The other thing is that I'm going to actually consider mixed order setting, which is K um, still on the faces. So for me, K on the faces is actually what dictates the convergence order of the method, but I'm actually going to take K plus one in the cells. I will explain later why in the unfitted context I'm doing this. And if you do this, then actually you can simplify the uh, stabilization. You remember that uh, we were enforcing some least squares penalty on this difference. And before we had some uh, correction involving the reconstruction operator, which here can be dropped. Uh, although you cannot drop this projection uh, of degree K. And this is actually known in the context of hybridizable discontinuous galerian. This is, was introduced by Lerenfeld uh, uh, back in his master thesis uh, in 2010. So we call it the Lerenfeld Schubert HDG stabilization. There is another variant that actually can also be considered is actually to lower by one the degree in the uh, set. Um, okay. Now, uh, this slide is a little bit loaded. Um, it attempts to give links and actually very close connection between HHO and other methods. And actually there are many connections so that this is why the slide is quite loaded. Uh, first for the lowest order, uh, there are the hybrid finite volumes and the mimetic mixed methods. Uh, then as was pointed out, uh, 
together with Bernardo uh, back in 2016, actually HHO can be embedded into the broader setting of HGG methods by specifying the numerical flux trace. Uh, so uh, this is quite uh, uh, straightforward to do. And perhaps the two main differences uh, uh, in HHO within this broad family of HGG method is on the first hand that for equal order, um, uh, you have a reconstruction used in the stabilization. So I think this is the first time it is considered in HGG methods. And second, that the analysis is actually simpler. Uh, because it's only based on L2 projections, whereas uh, the specialists know that the analysis of HDG requires some special projection uh, that uh, uh, is a little bit less uh, straightforward to manipulate. The second important point is that actually, um, uh, perhaps many of you know that uh, weak Galerkin methods are, are also a quite active area of development, especially in China and a little bit in the US. Uh, these methods were also introduced seven, eight years ago. And actually that's devising between HHO and weak Galerkin is extremely similar. Uh, in fact, what is called the weak gradient, uh, to me is not very, uh, proper terminology, but what is called the weak gradient in this community is actually nothing but the HHO gradient reconstruction that I presented. And uh, the other point of difference is that in general, in the uh, weak alerting papers, the stabilization is plain least squares, which is suboptimal for convergence rates, or sometimes they use the lehrenfeld Schubert stabilization. So, uh, this could be an interesting bridge to, uh, um, to clarify further uh, to uh, promote the development of these weak Galerkin methods. Also, uh, let me mention that HHO is equivalent up to the definition of stabilization uh, to non-conforming virtual element methods. In fact, if you consider the virtual space, which I wrote here, which is functions whose Laplacian is of degree K, usually in non-conforming them is K minus one. These are minor adaptations. And the normal uh, uh, derivative is a polynomial of degree k in each phase. This space is isomorphic to the HHO space. And in fact, uh, what then is called the computable gradient projection is nothing but the HHO gradient reconstruction. And the stabilization can be shown to be equivalent to the control in energy norms, so in the gradient, of the non-computable remainder. So the difference between a virtual function and its uh, uh, computable projection. So this was already pointed out uh, uh, in this work with Bernardo and further discussed in uh, these other two works. At the end of the day, I would say that having such a broad family with very close connections is a good news. And that different devising viewpoints, and because all these methods arrived at uh, a method uh, from a different perspective, uh, should be mutually enriching. Okay, so uh, let me mention that there are many applications. I don't expect that you are going to read all these references, but that, let me mention just solid mechanics, fluid mechanics, porous media and other topics, and that there are libraries and that actually uh, there are already industrial codes that uh, have uh, HHO methods, especially within the French electric company, EDF, Code Aste, which is quite used by the structural mechanics community, and Code Saturn, which is more for CFD, and there are ongoing developments at uh, the uh, uh, Atomic Energy uh, Agency. And uh, there are also two uh, libraries uh, that are being developed uh, in the more academic context. Okay, so now let me move to unfitted meshes. Uh, so uh, here my purpose is to consider that the problem has an interface that is a curved uh, manifold uh, that uh, separates the domain for simplicity in two subdomains, uh, one and two, and they have a normal that in orientates how the, the jumps are evaluated. And I think everyone is quite familiar with the elliptic interface problem, uh, where you prescribe the jump of the potential and the jump of the flux at the interface. And so we want to approximate the solution to this problem using HHO methods. Um, and let me mention that everything that I'm going to say on this topic actually uh, can be adapted to the case of a single domain with a curved boundary. Uh, so I'm, somehow I'm treating here a more uh, uh, complex situation. And the main idea of unfitted meshes is that you are actually going to uh, fit, uh, to, sorry, to mesh the, the whole domain without caring about the position of the interface 
so that the interface will cut the cells. So this is why it is called an unfitted mesh. And then you're going to adapt the numerical method to handle the fact that here on the red curve, it has to enforce these conditions in a weak, in a weak manner. And they're going to be enforced in a weak manner. Okay, so um, the, the first item is what I said. Let me mention that this is very well known and there is a lot of work using classical finite elements. And the key idea we are going to, um, um, to use is the one introduced uh, about 20 years ago by Peter and Hanita Anspo, uh, which is to double the unknowns in the cat cells uh, and then to use a consistent Nietzsche-like penalty technique to enforce the jump conditions in a weak manner. Uh, okay, then because of the fact that the interface can cut the cells more or less arbitrarily, uh, you expect some trouble because there will be what we call badly cut cells. I'm not going to quantify what it means, but there are um, definitions for that. And so you need to do something uh, to avoid very bad condition numbers uh, if uh, uh, there are badly cut cells. And one technique is the ghost penalty that was introduced by Eric Berman about 10 years ago. But actually an alternative is local cell agglomeration. So um, when there is a badly cut cell, you can agglomerate it locally with a neighboring cell. Uh, and this is natural for polytopal methods. So we found that uh, this idea was uh, already developed uh, for these continuous gathering methods in two works. And we found that it was a nice motivation for polytopal methods uh, such as HHO also. Let me also mention that uh, this can also be uh, somehow extended to continuous Galerkin methods. Okay, so the main ideas of uh, unfitted HHO, uh, which we developed with Eric uh, about three years ago, is actually we follow the uh, Hans Poe paradigm. We double the cell and the face unknowns, okay, because in HHO it's a hybrid method, so you have face and cell unknowns. We do not put any degree of freedom on the curved interface, so this is important. And uh, we consider a mixed order setting, uh, so we raise by one the degree of the cell unknowns, and we use local agglomeration to counter the bad cuts. Uh, then, uh, two years later, uh, with uh, my postdoc, uh, Guillaume Delay, we did some improvements, in particular, a novel gradient reconstruction that avoids the penalty parameter in Nietzsche method to be large enough. Because sometimes when you hear Nietzsche's method, um, you think, okay, this is a, a nice uh, way to enforce uh, uh, boundary conditions or jump conditions, but there is a parameter that must be large enough, uh, reminiscent of this uh, symmetric interior penalty, this continuous Galerkin method, but there is a way to avoid that, that is actually uh, known from this continuous Galerkin literature. And, here it can be, uh, this idea can be used. Uh, and also what we did is that we did a robust cell agglomeration procedure that guarantees locality. Uh, because we have to be careful that uh, when you agglomerate, you do not produce cells that, uh, uh, um, such that the agglomeration propagates too much. Uh, we also extended that uh, to Stokes uh, problems. So let's take a cell so this is an hexagonal cell uncut so it has uh, for degree zero on the face is one unknown and three in the cell because we raised by one the degree uh, in the cell and then the interface cuts so here is gamma cutting and then we double the unknown so now we have three cell unknowns on the one part and three on the other um, then we have the face unknowns you see that here we double the unknowns on the cut face uh, and now we are going to uh, consider, so um, it's just a little bit of notation. Uh, so a cell T is divided in T1 and T2, as you can expect. And T gamma is actually this part of the cell intersected by the interface. Okay, so now we have polynomials. Uh, we doubled the, the polynomials in the cell and the face. And to do the gradient reconstruction, we mimic the integration by parts. But then there is a the question of, uh, okay, you do integration by parts in T1, you will do an integration by parts in T2, but the question is you are missing a part of the boundary where there is no face unknown. And this is why we raise the degree of the cell unknown because there in T gamma, we use the trace of the cell unknown. So this is why we need one order more to be optimal, okay? So this is the key technical point. Now, there is a little subtlety because you have actually a cell unknown on the left and on the right, 
and the jump is prescribed. So suppose it is zero, otherwise it's just a, a change in the right hand side. So you can take one or the other. So this is actually reflected by the fact that we have two options for the gradient reconstruction. Either you take the trace from your side or you're actually going to take the trace from the neighbor side. Uh, both are consistent because you know the jump. Okay, and both options actually avoid the Nietzsche consistency term. So in fact, uh, you see that the local bilinear form has only the Galerkin term with the disreconstructed gradients. The lehrenfeld sherbel stabilization, which only acts in the interior phase of each subdomain. And then there is only the penalty uh, or the least squares penalty on the uh, interface which uh, enforces in a weak manner that the jump has to be given by something that is put on the right hand side. And this coefficient here is just order one, you can take it equal to one for stability. Now, uh, if we want a little bit more, we also want robustness with respect to the contrast. So we suppose that the two materials are quite contrasted and one has much less uh, lower diffusivity than the other. Then actually, if you take option one, uh, for uh, the uh, least uh, conducting material and option two for the other, then here you penalize with the lowest one, which is the root to actually achieve uh, error estimates that do not uh, have on the right hand side the contrast. Okay, so uh, essentially it, the bilinear form is symmetric, but the two subdomains do not play symmetric role because the reconstruction is different in the two subdomains. Okay, so now we put everything together. So we have our domain, we have the interface, which is circular. So then we have the cells unknowns and the face unknowns in blue in one subdomain, in some kind of green in the other one. Here I'm showing some agglomerated cells. You see that here there were two, originally two cells, but they were agglomerated into a single cell because of the bad cut uh, that was detected. So uh, at the end of the day, after agglomeration, you will have polynomials of degree K plus one in the cells on both sides and uh, of degree K on both sides for the faces. Okay, everything else is as before. Here you have the consistent modifications of the right-hand side based on the data you enforce as jump of the fluxes and the jump of the primal uh, unknowns. Okay, and everything else is as before and all the cell unknowns on both subdomains can be eliminated locally by static condensation uh, as before. Okay, then there are some lemmas. I don't want to detail this, uh, okay, but there are proofs uh, that if the interface is of class C2, that the mesh is fine enough with respect to the curvature of this manifold, then you can prove uh, these uh, trace inequalities that are important, as you all know, uh, for the uh, numerical analysis. Now, the criterion of the good or bad cuts is actually that you need a ball uh, on both sides of the interface of comparable diameter to the mesh. Uh, to the uh, to the local cell uh, to the local mesh size. Sorry, uh, okay. And this again, we prove that it is achievable on shape regular meshes if you do a local cell agglomeration and the mesh is fine enough. Okay. Then you prove the problem is coercive. And perhaps one technical point is that here you do not use anymore the L2 orthogonal projection for the analysis on the original cell, but on this. Uh, T dagger, which is uh, this ball that somehow covers uh, the cut cell. Okay, so it's a very technical point. So at the end of the day, you have optimal error estimates, uh, uh, the same as uh, for the uh, fitted case. So uh, it's optimal, uh, order k plus one, if the solution is locally of order k plus two. I mentioned very quickly that uh, uh, this gap here for uh, regularity between zero and one half. Uh, we did some work with Jean-Luc Guermont, uh, actually more broadly for DG uh, uh, and any non-conforming method. Okay, let me just give uh, you some illustrations of this agglomeration procedure. So you have here the interface in red, and you see these cells in light blue are bad cuts concerning uh, the domain one, because this part is very small, okay? You cannot fit a, a small ball uh, on this side. And this is the reverse situation for the other subdomain. So in a stage one, you take from one side and you find a partner for agglomeration freely. All these light blue look for a partner that is dark blue. Then there are in the second stage, some dark blue that did not uh, 
receive any offer of uh, being a partner. So they look also for their partner now. But of course, this can create propagations that uh, are not local anymore. And so then we showed that you can change a little bit and the uh, matchings, uh, the local matchings to ensure that at the end of the day, the any agglomerated cell is such that uh, there exists one cell within the agglomerate that is the neighbor of all the cells in the agglomerate. Okay, so this is an illustration for a circular interface, what happens, uh, and for a flower interface, and sometimes there are, you know, particular situations like that that can occur. Uh, this shows the optimal convergence rates for a uh, test case uh, where there is a jump in the, a strong jump in the diffusion, uh, and a test case where there is a strong jump, uh, where there is a jump uh, in the solution itself, so the solution is not C0 here. Okay, now we go to wave propagation. Uh, and so, uh, okay, everyone knows the uh, wave equation. So we have a second order derivative in time, second order derivative in space, some coefficients. You can extend that to elastodynamics if you wish. Then you can write a weak form here. So I'm putting indices uh, for the physical coefficients. And uh, it's well known that you have and a conservation of energy in the absence of forces. So you conserve the kinetic plus the internal energy. Now uh, we use the uh, HHO method and here we have this K prime that indicates that we can opt either for the equal order or the mixed order method. Uh, we do the gradient reconstruction. So the stabilization depends on the type of uh, order we chose for the cell unknowns. And then we assemble as before. Uh, so this is nothing new, so I skip. Um, and now this is probably the most important point within uh, wave equations, um, is that cell unknowns uh, are the only ones that have mass. Uh, so uh, in fact, you see that the time derivative uh, acts only on the cell unknowns, whereas the stiffness is based on the phase and the cell unknowns. Said it otherwise, if you take now a test function that is a cell test function, then you will express a balance of forces uh, in the cell level. Whereas if you take a discrete test function that is a phase test function, you will express the matching of the tractions or the forces or the fluxes across any interface. And so there is no mass here. This is instant instantaneous matching, okay? So the only uh, unknowns, in our opinion, that have mass are the cell unknowns. So this is quite important for the structure. And uh, it's straightforward to see that you have, again, an energy that is conserved, that has for kinetic energy what the, kin the kinetic energy of the cell unknowns, whereas the internal energy is those of the cell and phase unknowns, plus the fact that the stabilization is a modification of the energy. Huh? As usual in stabilization methods, huh? uh, here you obtain it as a modification of the energy. OK, if you go uh, at the algebraic level, then you see that it has some impact because the time derivatives are only acting on this uh, upper uh, line of the system. Now, these matrices are block diagonal. But you see that this matrix KFF is not block diagonal huh? because of the couplings of the faces uh, between each other locally. Each cell has a coupling of all its faces. So here, this matrix is only sparse. Uh, so it means that in this form, the system will not be convenient for explicit time stepping because you could, of course, make something explicit here. But here, you will have some uh, need to invert the, this matrix. Okay. Uh, okay, let me mention this work rather recent for uh, HGG method for the wave equation. Let me mention that, okay, there is some analysis. You, you obtain optimal orders of convergence in energy norm, in L2 norm. Uh, that the proofs actually adapt the seminal ideas by Dupont and Baker and Wheeler. And actually, the proof is simpler than for HDG because, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we do not need the HDG projection, which actually, for time-dependent problems, uh, reflects uh, that you need uh, to change the initialization of the schema to analyze it. Whereas here, uh, we can just take the L2 orthogonal projections for the initial condition, and this is uh, compatible with the analysis we do. And let me mention that actually we could, one could revisit the paper by Grote, Schnebeli, and Schoetzau on DG uh, using discrete gradients to um, simplify uh, somehow their, their proofs. 
Okay, so then you can do the Newmark scheme, uh, which is a quite well known scheme, essentially up to a predictor and corrector step, you have this step where you solve, again, after static condensation, you solve a global transmission problem for the acceleration on the cells. Okay, so it's on the cells that uh, you have this problem, you see, because the, the, the only the acceleration is on the cells. Okay, the discrete energy is exactly conserved. These are uh, classical manipulations for Newmark schemes. Uh, uh, but as I mentioned, okay, the, the central finite difference scheme, uh, which is supposed to be explicit, will not be convenient because you need to invert this matrix. So this uh, prompts us to consider the first order formulation of the, C of the wave equation, which is uh, quite well known. You introduce the velocity, the flux, you write it as a first order system, uh, we see here now an uh, skew symmetric uh, uh, presence of the differential operators in space. So it's a type of Friedrich system. You have again an energy that is conserved, but now it's written with the primal variables, the velocity and the flux. And in HHO, uh, discretization or HGG or weak Galerkin or non conforming band discretization, uh, I mean, all these are, as we saw, are equivalent uh, up to. Uh, some minor modifications. So uh, you actually have primal uh, and, uh, uh, sorry, you have cell and phase unknown, so hybrid unknown for the velocity, uh, but you only have cell unknowns for the flux. And uh, the skew symmetric differential operator in space would be here the gradient, okay, that is integrated by parts, uh, so acts on this other variable, and you stabilize the velocity equation. Now, the, the, here the weight is uh, uh, order one instead of h minus one. Uh, I, if I have time, I will briefly comment on that. And the main difference that is actually known in the HGG contest as well is that uh, for the first order system, stabilization now is a dissipative mechanism. It's no longer a modification of the energy. You see that now the energy is not modified. It has only two contributions, kinetic and internal energy. But there is an additional dissipative mechanism in time that is the stabilization. Okay, so it, the stabilization acts in quite different ways in the two uh, formulations, second order and first order. Now, if you go to the algebraic level, you will have uh, three lines because you have one for the cell unknowns of the flux, the only ones, and then you have the cell and the phase unknowns of the velocity. And uh, the key point is that now you see that uh, for this block here, uh, that couples the phases, only the stabilization is present, not more the gradient, because the gradient has now become off diagonal because you have an additional variable. But now you see that there is a key difference between the equal order and the mixed order uh, settings, because in the equal order, there is a coupling of the phases because the reconstruction is used in the stabilization. Whereas in the mixed order, where we use one order higher in the cell unknowns, uh, then you, we use the lerenfeld schubert stabilization, and this stabilization does not couple the phases, okay? The stabilization is done phase-wise, whereas the other one couples all the phases in a cell. So this is easy to invert, and so now we have a route to uh, develop explicit time-stepping schemes without having mass on the phase unknowns. Okay, so these considerations are found also in this paper in the context of HDG method, but they're formulated in a different, uh, with different uh, words. Okay, now uh, that we have uh, clarified this point, we can do time stepping. So um, either like singly diagonal implicit Runge-Kutta or explicit Runge-Kutta. If we do explicit schemes, uh, uh, we verify that we have a first order CFL condition, which means that the time step is uh, or essentially the current number, which is velocity times the time step divided by the mesh size is bounded by a non-dimensional quantity that depends on the number of stages very mildly and the order, the degree, the polynomial order, uh, which uh, should behave typically as the reciprocal of the polynomial degree. So more uh, 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 tighter CFL conditions as the polynomial degree increases. Okay, so these are uh, a few illustrations. Uh, here I consider the Newmark scheme in time. So this is convergence in time. Uh, H1 norm is uh, these dashes and, uh, um, sorry, these, uh, uh, not dashes, but uh, like thick lines and the thin lines is the L2. 
error, so which is one order higher. And then it's k equal uh, degree zero, one, and two. In space, it's order two. And you see that the energy is conserved to 10 to the minus 14. Uh, and if you change a little bit the parameters, then you do not have energy conservation. Now, for uh, the uh, first order formulation and runga kuta schemes, um, it seems that, uh, uh, OK, you have these two choices for the stabilization order one or H minus one. And uh, uh, actually only the second here will give optimal convergence rates for the L2 norm. Whereas both of them give optimal convergence rates for the H1 norm. We do not have analysis for that yet. We only prove optimal convergence rates for this choice so far. Uh, but if you take this choice and you do explicit schemes, uh, uh, the CFL condition worsens to uh, quadratic CFL. So this is not an option for explicit schemes, whereas for implicit schemes, uh, it's uh, an option that uh, is worth uh, being pursued, in our opinion. Now, this is an heterogeneous test case, 1D, with analytical solution in the form of a series. The velocity contrast is 10. You have a Gaussian pulse that is partly transmitted and reflected at this interface. And you see here the benefits of raising the polynomial degree from k equal 1, 2, 3. This is still the Newmark scheme. Now, in 2D, we, uh, this is still fitted because the interface here is flat. The contrast in the velocities is 5. Here, we have what is called the Mexican hat or Ricker wavelet that starts here and then crosses the interface, is reflected, is transmitted. And the interest of this setting is that uh, there is a semi-analytical solution in case of infinite media. So as long as there is no reflection on the boundary, uh, it's for short times, you have an analytical solution. So these illustrations is, for instance, for the um, implicit runga kuta with degree five uh, in space and degree uh, order four in, uh, in time. Now, if you look at the computational efficiency, you observe, uh, this is the red column here, that, uh, OK, so here we put a sensor somewhere in the upper domain, and we calibrate the time step so that all the methods deliver more or less the same error. And then we look at the time. And the time is the product of the number of steps times the cost per step. And you see that if uh, uh, direct solvers are not allowed, then uh, the explicit runga kuta scheme is the winner. Uh, not by much, uh, but is the winner. But if you allow direct solvers, uh, this is uh, definitely the winner, the implicit schemes. Uh, but you see that uh, if even with an iterative solver, uh, this uh, is uh, quite uh, uh, competitive with an explicit schema. So these are preliminary findings, of course, it's just for one uh, test case with one software and so on. Okay, so very briefly, uh, just uh, a few minutes. Uh, now we go to unfitted meshes. It's just a question of putting everything together. They are not really new ideas. So uh, we have the wave equations with jump conditions. So here you can imagine that you have a source here in the center, you have a flower-like interface, and then you have here the transmission and the reflection of the wave. And so we do this uh, with unfitted meshes. Um, uh, the technology is the same as before. We have these uh, special reconstructions. We have the lehrenfeld schober stabilization inside its subdomain the Nietzsche-like penalty in, at the interface. Uh, we do new marks time stepping, as in the fitted case. Uh, uh, we have an error analysis. Uh, OK, I skip the technicalities. We can also do the first order formulation. Again, uh, the penalties will go to the velocity. Uh, and uh, let me just give you this illustration. So here we, we are considering uh, the same test case as before, 2D heterogeneous flat interface. So we compare the fitted and the unfitted, OK? We run it with a fitted and with an unfitted mesh. And you see here that there are three curves in each case. This is low contrast. This is strong contrast. This is degree 1. This is degree 3. And in each case, there are three curves. There is the semi-analytical solution that finishes flat because the waves propagate into an infinite medium. And there are the red and the blue curves, which are the curves that we compute on a bounded box. So there are reflections on the boundary. And so we depart from the semi-analytical setting at some time. And you see that one is the fitted, one is the unfitted. So uh, there are some differences, but both of them oscillate. So both of them are not so good for degree one, but for degree three, you see that they are very sharp and coincide very well with the semi-analytical solution until the time where here around 
point 85, uh, the reflected waves from the boundary have reached the sensor. You can see here the plot where you see where the sensor is located with this red dot. I hope everyone can see it. We studied the CFL condition, compared the, the fitted and unfitted case, and found that essentially for the various polynomial degrees, uh, you pay 50% more CFL in the unfitted case. So the fact that you have additional penalties to enforce the jump conditions do have an effect uh, on the stiffness of, of the system. And so they have an effect on the CFL, but not so much, in my opinion. And uh, now let's look at a circular interface. So you have an interface and you see finer and finer meshes. You see the agglomerated cells. And here you see the parameter that quantifies the tolerance with respect to cuts. And the smaller the parameter, the more we are tolerant. So we allow bad cuts, but we say, ah, it's still okay, don't worry, don't agglomerate. So the first line will have a lot of agglomerated cells, and this bottom line will have few agglomerated cells. But you see that uh, if you are too tolerant, uh, here the CFL is impacted by a factor 2.5, roughly. So this uh, shows you that uh, it is important to uh, counter the bad cuts at some point, uh, and a good compromise seems to be 0 0.3, which is that the ball has to be a diameter at least 30% of the original cell. Last image is now a flower-like interface, uh, and we compare again the signals at the sensors and find uh, now a good matching between the semi-analytical solution, um, no, no, sorry, between the um, uh, degree one, two, and three, you see how it uh, improves progressively. And this is the computational time, and uh, now the winner is the implicit, okay? It's a little bit faster than the explicit. So there are many things still to be done uh, to clarify the choice of the penalty parameter in the first order case, one or H minus uh, one. Okay, there are some technicalities in the analysis, uh, also small faces, what is the impact on the condition number? The implementation is only 2D for the time being. Uh, uh, handling the cuts in 3D requires uh, more implementation. Uh, quadratures are done by subtessellation, whereas uh, we know that there are more efficient techniques. We and we are currently in implementing an isoparametric uh, uh, use uh, uh, of quadratures. Um, and just to finish, let me uh, uh, give you the references for this talk. Uh, so these three papers on unfitted HHO then those on the wave propagation, and perhaps a short advertisement that finally, after 10 years of working on that with Jean-Luc Germont, uh, we uh, have these three volumes published uh, on finite elements. So uh, if you're interested, we hope that you enjoy uh, reading them. Thank you very much for your attention.